Dr. Bob Larson um, has been a great influence to so many people in the ministry of deliverance and I think that I would say that he's the one that pioneered so much of what we see today. Uh, a lot of the young people that are rising up and even the deliverance revival, the deliverance awakening that is taking place in the United States where deliverance is becoming a culture, it's becoming um, normal, almost like it's being normalized. And um, Dr. Bob, he paved that way, not only exposing the ministry of deliverance, but also posting deliverance, something that is extremely controversial in many circles, but he paved that way of exposing the kingdom of darkness by getting people to share their testimony in deliverance by posting them online. I've never seen that before in some, somebody doing that in, in the United States. And not only that, but his teaching on mental illness and deliverance and how to deal with that. And God has given him a huge platform um, in the world where he's been featured on so many TV shows and so many networks. In fact, if you type uh, Dr. Bob Larson on YouTube, most of the videos that will show up will not be his sermons. It will be his interviews on very known networks and not only he has, I feel like, represented this ministry to a young generation, but he has represented this ministry to the world, to people who are curious in the, in the topic of supernatural and exorcism and they're looking to him to provide those answers. Uh, on the top of that, I do appreciate his ministry so much. He's been a great help to personally to our ministry, people on our team. And he's one of those men who is not just talking about it and did it 20, 30 years ago. If we ask him, probably he did it 20 minutes ago or two hours ago. He is in the trenches. His sword is sharp. His experiences are fresh. And so uh, guys, let's help to welcome uh, Dr. Bob Larson much those are very kind words it's just exhausting hearing all <laughs> i can't believe it i've done it and i'm doing it <laughs> come on come on uh, uh dr bob how many personal deliverances one-on-one -on -one have you done in your ministry career uh well actually for about the last uh, year or so we've been quoting the figure figure fifty thousand. uh that 50, seems like a lot yeah, 50,000 documented cases. These are not just, you know, hit and run. Mm -hmm. uh, this is on record in our files, one on one. But I do an average of about 1,000 to 1,500 a year, uh, depending, some a little less, oftentimes more. Uh, but if you, again, you roll it back and you look at the math, I'm doing mm -hmm. this now. Uh, an average of six, sometimes seven days a week, anywhere from uh, five to six to eight to 10 people sessions a day. So like, and I was here, I uh, started out at eight o'clock this morning, which was uh, <clears throat> about 10 hours ago. And it's just been one person after another all day long. Oh, and that's what I do. And the demand is so great that, uh, you know, we're, we're booked many months in advance with people desperate. And mm -hmm. I, I, you know, so people ask me, well, gee, out of all of that, what's most interesting? And I say, what happened five minutes ago? You know, <laughs> it's, it's just truly incredible uh -huh. when you, you know, you, you you have an opportunity to talk to people all over the world. About mm -hmm. half of our clientele is outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. They're all over the world and they're desperate. They don't have any answers, but mm -hmm. they, you know, they see people like you and, uh, and others and see us on the Internet. And I say, well hey, maybe that's my problem. Mm -hmm. So we stay very, very busy and I have been very busy, uh, but thank the Lord, I'm in a great and, health. I'm and COVID, harder, COVID didn't before. change, COVID didn't change anything. You pretty much, imp you started to do it, but have you been doing them on Skype and Zoom before COVID? Yes, uh, I started doing Skype about 10 years ago before there was Zoom. And there's an interesting story behind that. <clears throat> I was doing it and mm -hmm. nobody really knew I was doing it. And, and CNN, they, you know, before they turned so political, they were actually reported news. <laughs> so they sent a, one of their top reporters out here and he said, we've, we've heard about this thing of exorcisms on uh -huh. Skype. You can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. And so they sent their cameras in and I let them watch me do this. And they actually reported it on Anderson Cooper's show. And then Comedy Central, 
sent a crew out from uh, John What's His Face's show. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, he's retired now. And uh, so they did a story on it. And, you know, they interviewed Catholic priests, Protestant ministers. They basically, you can't do this. You can't do this. It has to be in face, face to face, has to be in person. You cannot do this. And, uh, and then, you know, they say, well, they would ask them, well, what's Skype? You know, <laughs> back then they didn't even know what Skype was. They didn't even know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But, but the Lord led me to do that because wow. uh, there were people who needed help and I couldn't always see them face to face. How do you... What do you think are the main benefits of doing a personal one-on-one deliverance, whether it's on Skype or in person, versus the one that is happening at the church altar call or during the altar deliverance? Well, to me, there, there is, there is, there's several different models of, of how you can go about doing deliverance. So we have right now uh, the virtual model, we have the in-person model, uh, and then we have the seminar or public appearance model. Most of what I used to do was the public appearance model. COVID came, and then we just switched the whole thing primarily to either in-person here at our mm-hmm. offices where they come to see me in Phoenix, Arizona, or virtually. And so mm-hmm. here's what I've discovered. Um, when it's in person, obviously it's, it's better. We always encourage people come to see us in person. But if mm-hmm. you can't, we understand. Like I just got off of a, a, a Zoom with somebody in Dubai a little bit ago. Well, you know, they, they may not jump on a plane from Dubai. What you're missing, um, sometimes it's minimal, but sometimes it's important. Sort of that tactile thing, that that's, that sense of presence there. And, mm-hmm. and when you try to psych out a demon, you know, I'm looking at the eyes, I'm watching the body language. You don't necessarily see all of that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about. They're yeah. starting to manifest and their legs start shaking or a hand starts moving under the table. Mm-hmm. You don't see that on camera, but you catch those little nuances and you know that something you're saying is striking home. Mm-hmm. Um, can you take us through a uh, typical deliverance session of yours? and how you on your end would conduct it. So let's just say somebody signs up for a deliverance. Um, do they you know, fill out some kind of a form? I'm just kind of trying to help also people who are becoming interested in this ministry just to kind of learn from, you know, you're, you're a veteran in this area. And so would you take us through a typical deliverance session that you conducted today? Okay, well, uh, first of all, they have to fill out an intake. Uh, they have to sign a release, giving us permission to minister to them, because you never know what's going to happen during the deliverance. And the intake form uh, is fairly simple, but it asks targeted questions. So when I look at that intake form before I get on the camera with them, uh, I know within 30 seconds what the problem is and what I'm looking for and what direction we're going to go, because I've seen the patterns so many times at the intersection of the various things that they're dealing with and they're troubled about. And and that's so helpful because when I sit down to talk to these people and to minister to them, I don't have to ask a bunch of random questions. I already know the answers. I know their life history. I know their ethnicity. I know their age, what their work is, what their family life was like, when they became a Christian, Mm -hmm. what are the problems they're dealing with? What are the mental health issues that they're being treated for? I already know that. And that's such an advantage going in. You don't have to sit down and fumble around and say, oh, why are you here today? And how can I help you? Already know what they want. Now, I have probably a half a dozen targeted questions that I don't quite understand. So, for example, somebody just says, I was molested. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, probably 40 to 50% of the people who come to me have some sexual abuse in their background. Mm-hmm. But then the question is, what age? Who did it? What were the circumstances? What therapeutic help Mm -hmm. have you had to process that information? Have you had inner healing and deliverance to help you in that Mm -hmm. uh, greater understanding? So I find out what the target issues are and where I think the demonic doors are open in their life. Mm -hmm. And there's usually a half a dozen or so of those that if, if, if I see those in the profile, they've got a demon. I just, I just assume that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a reasonable assumption that I then then what I do is try to connect with the person, put them at ease, uh, let them know that that <clears throat> there's hope. Because a lot of people, as you know, who come from deliverance, they're at the point where they, they're not so sure there's any hope anymore for them, you know? Mm-hmm. And some of them have been suicidal. They tried to kill themselves. They've been cutters. They've been in and out of mental institutions. Um, they've been abused and are broken so often in their lives. They, they're just without hope. You've got to speak hope to them, okay? We can do this. Mm-hmm. You can get fixed. Jesus did not plan your life to be like this. This is what the devil's done. And then as I start through that process, there's a point at which I look at them and I say, okay, cut to the chase. You are demons. Now, I don't always say that because sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But generally by the time people get to me, they usually have demons. Uh, they've figured out they have demons. Mm-hmm. You know, there's stuff going on. And they say, all right, let's go after this. So I spent about the first you know, 20, 25 minutes analyzing the situation in addition to the data that I already have. Mm -hmm. And then we go after the demon. And I set them up. I say, I just want you, I don't want your help. I don't want you to pray. I want you to just sit there calmly and in your mind, be in the presence of Christ. Let him take you away just to be with him, worship Mm -hmm. him in your mind, but don't get in the way. I don't want your help. This Mm -hmm. is now between the Lord and me and the demons. So this is not people, it's, it's, it's not required for them to be praying, speaking in tongues or anything of the, on the opposite. They just need to be in the receiving yeah. position. Yeah, yeah. Because anything they're doing, this is the way I describe it. This is you. This is the devil. I'm trying to get to the devil. But if your brain out here is active, I can't get to him. One state of consciousness at a time can be at the forefront. So if the demon is manifesting, you got to be back here and let it manifest. And, and that's really the biggest hurdle to get over. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people, they've been to deliverance ministries and they said, we don't need you to manifest. We don't let demons talk. We tell them to be quiet. So I got to reverse all that thinking. And uh, I say to them, well, uh, objectively, how would anybody know you have a demon? How could you confirm that unless the demon confirms it? Mm-hmm. I said, furthermore, the biggest issue leading to the demonization is usually not known by the person. Mm-hmm. So let, let's say they, they've had trauma in their life using the example of sexual molestation. All right. So they know it's a trauma. They, they, they know there's something there, but they don't know who did it, why they did it, how many generations that curse goes back. Only the demon can tell you that. They don't know that. So I said, look, I want I want the demon to tell me and objectify this process. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking then moving from the biographical information that is there in the intake to then the existential information that's coming forth from the demonic manifestation. And uh, Dr. Bob and people who would maybe object and say, well, we don't need to hear the information from demons because they're lying spirits and we should just rely on the Holy Spirit alone. What do you tell them? That's stupid. <laughs> it's just stupid. Well, now, wait a minute. Of course, demons lie. Okay. So that's where somebody who is skilled in the deliverance ministry is watching. And mm-hmm. sometimes I'll say, that's a lie. You know, that's a mm-hmm. lie. I'm not buying it. So you track the information. If the information and the evidence seems to be consistent with the problem the person has, Mm -hmm. and every once in a while I'll say, if you're lying, Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's going to strike you. Now, is that the truth? Was there a rape? 10 generations ago that started all of this. Yes or no, I hold that answer up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are ways you put them under pressure. Mm -hmm. You put them under stress. You force the issue. The problem is a lot of people get in deliverance. They do, you know, what I call deliverance light. And they just want to tippy toe around on the thing. Mm -hmm. I come charging in like a bull in a china shop. Mm -hmm. And I'm letting those demons know, hey, 
we're in charge through Jesus Christ, and mm -hmm. you are going to tell us what we need to know. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's just a matter of expressing affirmative authority and making the demons cower. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you you have made it not only popular, but I feel like you explained it so well um, in your ministry. And it's almost like counter, counter um, this mainline deliverance that is happening. Those who do practice deliverance, one of the first things they teach is that make sure demons never manifest. Make sure you bind the manifestation. And, uh, and a lot of times it's like, well, how do you know that you're dealing with the demon? Um, and then it's in the scripture. It's very clear that Jesus was never binding the manifestation. And anytime he rebuked the demons from manifesting or speaking out, it's for the same reasons that he told people not to testify of him to other people because he didn't want his fame to spread too fast. And so I feel like people take those scriptures out of context and, um, and they, they don't experience a fullness of that deliverance by limiting the, the expression of the ministry of deliverance. Now in, in your case, when you do one-on-one -on -one deliverance in your office or on, your, uh, on, in, in, on Skype or on, on Zoom, um, I mean, do you scream? Do you yell uh, at a demon? Or you just simply, the demons don't leave because we yell and scream? Or it's just, it's the authority in the name of Jesus and the authority and the firmness of your voice? Yeah, that, that's it. Well, my voice is firm. When I go mm -hmm. after them, I go after them. And I just look them in the eye and say, you are going to do what I tell you to do through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And you're going to tell us how you got there and who you are and what you're holding on to in this person's life. You got that? Well, when you take that type of affirmative stance, you don't need to scream and yell and mm -hmm. holler and get all histronic about it. It's just, it's a process. Now, once in a while, in a, a public setting, people mm -hmm. get a little more rambunctious, you know, because it's a freer atmosphere, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're not sitting in, in front of a a, a, a computer screen, but, but you know, I had this happened yesterday. I'm looking at this guy and he's manifesting. And the next thing I know, the screen's blank. He's somewhere on the floor. I don't know what's going on. I can hear him thrashing about. Uh -huh. and finally, you know, he gets back up and gets in front of a camera again and we go on. You know, that happens. But, but most of the time, you know, it sits, it's just pretty much eyeball to eyeball like I'm talking to you now. Do you see demons manifest? Um, all the time or how do you get and I know that in your course and something that we'll mention at the end make sure you guys stay till, till the end um, Dr. Bob will mention and we will mention his school but in your school you also encourage to get demon to manifest during a deliverance and exorcism session um, what are some practical ways so let's say you you know the person's story you interview them you analyze talk with them a little bit it's pretty obvious they have a demon um, how do you get the demon to manifest so one thing you mentioned is that okay don't that person needs to just be in the receiving mode in the presence of Christ but how do you get the demon to manifest because it's way easier to cast them out number one if you don't have confidence that the demon is going to manifest mm -hmm. he's not going to manifest that's, a, that's an issue of faith of the person who's ministering deliverance. I look at the evidence. Uh, I have one of, my, one of my books is called Dealing with Deliverance, Dealing with Demons. And I, I talk about it there, the ev evidentiary approach. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I just look at that thing and I say, all right, I'm going to list 10 reasons why I know this woman has demons. And I just list them right off. And I say to the demons, the evidence is there. You're not going to hide. You're going to come out and face me. I'm expressing faith. The demons have to know that I have confidence. Mm -hmm. God's going to force the issue. Too many deliverance ministers are just wimps about it. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we're going to just do this little soothing prayer, and we're going to get a word from God here, and a prophecy here, and an encouragement here, and then we're going to send you on your way. Well, that's fine once they're free. But how are you going to get the demon out? And I have people. This is common happens all day long every day I say you know about a third of the people I deal with have been for some kind of deliverance and they you know what who did you see what happened etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. and I ask him I said when I ask one question did the demon speak That's good. well no they they just told me it was gone I said a demon doesn't 
go. This is, we teach in our school of exorcism. A demon doesn't go until it's made to go. Mm -hmm. It's their home. You got to throw them out. Mm -hmm. And the violent take it by force. And that's what we have to do if we're really going to set people free. I, and, and, you know, sometimes it's almost incredulous. I, I say, you've been raped twice. You've been molested. You're a cutter. You, you've tried suicide. Mm -hmm. You've done meth. You've been smoking weed your whole life. And somebody told you that the demon doesn't have to manifest. <laughs> Come on. I want to know how your life ended up like that. Mm -hmm. Because when you were an innocent little baby, that's not where you were going. Mm -hmm. Something happened. What went wrong? I want the demon to tell me. And you know, Pastor Vlad, many times we can make an assumption about why somebody is, uh, is under demonic control or, or they've got all these problems. And sometimes the real answer is off the grid. It isn't yeah. what you think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not always the obvious. And, and all of a sudden they mention something. And then that's where the Holy Spirit could, can, can give you a word of knowledge or quicken you and say, wait a minute, I think it's that. Mm -hmm. And there it is. It, it's not the main thing. It's something tangential over here. And then that's where the Holy Spirit takes over. But if the demon isn't manifesting, if he isn't coming forth, you can't get confirmation that that thing God is showing you is real. And then I say to the demon, wait a minute now. The Holy Spirit's impressing me that this is the real reason you're holding on to this person's life. Yes or no? Yes. You know, it, it's, it's, it is, you know, it, you, you're going through all this material and all this thing. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, wait a minute. Has a grandmother who's an aunt? A, 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 an aunt or a grandmother who's a witch this mm -hmm. person doesn't even know it and the mm -hmm. demon says oh yeah they've been practicing witchcraft on this family for years mm -hmm. well there you go and, and i can't emphasize enough how important it is to get proprietary information mm -hmm. through interrogation mm -hmm. through interrogation and that's what a lot of people i feel like they're missing out they think they think that we are um having a conversation with the demon you know and it's an interrogation no, with the no, demon no, no. yeah conversation we have no, with people i ask the questions you give me the answers mm -hmm. yeah 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 now uh dr bob when it comes to doing deliverance on people one-on-one -on -one, um you use the cross and there are times you even use the the water and for people in the western countries like I've been to Africa, so I've seen, actually, we were practicing to do deliverance for about four years with holy water. And very controversial. Uh, I mean, in, in America, people trip, over, tr people trip over that because, you know, we're used to anointing oil. And, and so you're walking with the cross. Many times you're using a Bible as, uh, you know, and the demons react to that. For somebody who will object to that and say, well, that's not necessary. Could you speak a little bit about how you came into that and why uh, the Bible, the cross, and all of these spiritual elements, they frighten demons. Well, because what the church has known for centuries and the evangelical church in the law, in the West has lost is iconography. Hmm. I'm not saying we necessarily have to have images hanging on our walls. You know, I mean, you know, you're from you're Ukraine and you know what some of the Orthodox churches are like, you know, they're these little tiny buildings and you just go in to light a candle and look at some statues and some pictures, you know, that's what you do. That's not what we're about. But many times all I have to do is pick up my cross and, and just look at that demon. I don't say a word. And they just start getting terrified because I don't have to preach a sermon. This says it all. I hold this up in front of a demon, it says it all. This is what I stand on. This is the basis for my being here. This is the authority by which I'm going to interrogate you. And if you don't like it, boom, sometimes I just whack them with it. And they scream, scream. It doesn't hurt anybody, you know, just to hit them with a Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the demons scream. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, many times, 
and, and you'll see videos of me doing this. They'll say, get, get that thing away from me. Get, get it away from me. I can't stand it. Get it away from me. Because without me having to preach a sermon, it says it all. The cross, the Bible, mm-hmm. the holy water, the anointing oil. Mm-hmm. It's, it's about the presence of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's just this reminder of a kind of visualized way for that demon to grasp what we're doing. Mm-hmm. It's Come been on. a psychodrama, mm-hmm. but it's psychodrama intended to put fear into the heart of the demon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, there's a, a, this belief and almost like a, it's becoming part of the deliverance culture that you don't do deliverance on unbelievers. And I, of course, I have an issue with that because, you know, I don't see, you know, Jesus asking every person first to get saved before he, uh, he did deliverance on them. What is in your practice? Because you've done deliverance on people uh, who probably were not believers and afterwards they became believers. Do you require a person to make a confession of faith before you uh, bring deliverance to them? Or you can minister deliverance like ministers minister healing and then they lead that person to the Lord? It depends on the situation, okay. obviously, case by case. But if I think I'm working with somebody <clears throat> like who's a Muslim or a Buddhist, okay, and uh, but they but they're desperate. I have a lot of Sikh people come to me. That's Sikh, not sick. Sikh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, good people, good moral people. Yeah, they may be idolaters. They they may be things that are hold them in the demonic bondage. But if I if I say to them, and they're drawn, they're drawn by what they see. They're drawn to Jesus. They're drawn by what they see me doing to help people. And I'm I'm not going to send them away and say, well, you know, you got to say these five things, uh, of make this doctrinal statement and pray this prayer after me, and then you're going to qualify. Sometimes I write up front say, now, look, I want you to understand something. I am a Christian exorcist. My faith is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who's going to have to set you free, not me. Just do you understand that? And and almost all of them say, yeah, I understand that. They get that. But but I don't make that from there on the litmus litmus test. I let them see and experience the power of Christ in their life. And almost always, they're ready to turn their life over to Jesus when that happens. Mm-hmm. Because they've experienced it. You know, like, it's like the Syrophoenician woman who came mm-hmm. to see Jesus. And we I'm really don't know that. her background. But she came from a pagan, idolatrous country. That was her culture. But she'd heard this Jesus. And she knew her daughter had demons. And, mm-hmm. and, and so Jesus kept testing her faith. He didn't send her away. The disciples were like, we'll get rid of her. Come on, let's get her out of here. Mm-hmm. She's just a nuisance. And she just kept pastoring Jesus. And finally, he he healed her and said, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Your daughter's wow. healed. Wow. You know? And so wow. he brought her to a place of faith. Mm-hmm. He didn't say, now, you need to confess this and confess this. He knew her heart. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I've seen, you know, one of my most interesting cases, I had a woman who was a Buddhist. Um, she had been to Tibet. She had been to visit the Dalai Lama. I mean, she was a Buddhist of the Buddhist. Mm-hmm. But she was tormented, and she had been raped and repeatedly and had all these horrible, traumatic experiences in her life. And I, I just said, okay, well, let me help you through these, these experiences therapeutically. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then as I began to minister in the name of Jesus, she broke down weeping. She was crying. And uh, in the process of all of that, I just gently said to her, would you like Jesus to come into your life? Because he's the one who you're feeling right now. It's his love that you're feeling. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. Wow. And, and we can sort out the doctrinal issues later, mm-hmm. the theological issues, the confession of faith and the mm-hmm. baptism and all of that. But but mm-hmm. right then and there, it's just the presence of Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. And thank you for clarifying that because I've always been on that line as well, that yes, deliverance is the children's bread, but Jesus, he fed the multitudes and he touched the multitudes and Jesus doesn't make differentiation if somebody is hurting and suffering and they're even from another religion 
you know, we are to minister to them. We can get the demons out. Yeah, there's a danger of them coming back, but demons don't necessarily come back because the house is empty as much as they come back because there's an open door. There's a lot of unbelievers who don't have demons because they didn't have those open doors or maybe the ancestors didn't sacrifice anything. And so I think this idea that a lot of times Christians have, they're just more rooted in tradition than in actual experience and backed up with scripture. Because I like to use the example of my house. Like right now I am in, in my friend's Everett house. So my house is empty. But just because it's empty, it doesn't mean that rats and mice and everything gets into it because my house is closed. So nothing can get into it. And so it's the open doors that expose people to demons than just, oh, they're not filled enough with the Bible, not filled enough with the discipleship. And so um, how you have a very powerful understanding and also ministry in regards to mental health and psychology. And how important is the basic understanding of psychology and mental health when ministering deliverance? Well, uh, we teach it uh, in our International School of Exorcism, we, and we have some more credentialed teaching that we're about to release in which I go even deeper into this understanding, particularly of uh, Jungian and Freudian psychology, because it's part of the language of our culture. It's part of the understanding of how people see themselves. We throw these terms around, the conscious, the unconscious, uh, dysfunction, uh, psychopathology, uh, psychopath. I mean, we just, we throw terms around that a hundred years ago, people just didn't throw out there. Mm -hmm. So there's this vague sense that people have of, of fitting into a category, and particularly if they've already had some psychotherapeutic experience. Mm -hmm. It's really important to, to have a sense of what they've been told. So if you don't study a little bit about psychology, you don't know the paradigm they're coming from mm -hmm. when you're trying to introduce Jesus Christ to them and you're trying to introduce deliverance to them. But in addition to that, it's helpful to know if they do have certifiable mental illness issues. It doesn't mean they don't have demons. They can have both. Mm -hmm. They may have one, they may have the other, but you, you can't rush into it with a preconception that everything is always this or everything is always this. So one of the things we do in our intake form is we ask them to list all their medications. Okay. We ask them all to list all their, their past therapeutic uh, interventions and mm -hmm. any current interventions. Well, that's really important. Uh, I'll give you a case. I was working with an individual today. And uh, so, I, you know, they were trying to, this person had just been six months in a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this young girl had tried to kill herself numerous times. And the parents are very, very desperate. And I said, well, what's being done for her right now? And he said, well, we've, we've got her seeing this therapist and he's using EMDR and brain spotting. And, and, and so that's what we're, we're depending on. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't know what brain spotting is, you know, what EMDR is, you don't have a clue what that, person is going through and 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 how they're being affected by the, the therapy that they're getting. You mm -hmm. don't know how that intersects with what you're trying to tell them about Jesus and deliverance. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an expert in these things, but you have to know enough to have a little bit of education. And, you know, it's somebody, you know, a lot of the psychotherapists and many chiropractors, for example, and many fine Christian ones, but there are some that were doing energy healing and Reiki and laying on of hands of people and all kinds of stuff. So you got to know what these people are going through and what they're doing, mm -hmm. because it may be a block to the deliverance mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So I'm very careful about what I say. And, and I said to this person today, now, you know, I respect the, um, the psychotherapeutic relationship you have with your clinician, I'm just going to tell you what my thinking is on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And then let me minister deliverance and let's see how much um, this person needs help. Now, this is what's really interesting. This person spent this 15 year old girl who's halfway around the world mm -hmm. trying to kill herself uh, six months at a mental hospital <clears throat> And 
I'm listening to her talk and it's very clear to me she has dissociative identity disorder. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing different personalities speak to me. And I said, well, with all these odd techniques they're using to try to fix you and all the drugs they pumped into you while you were in the hospital, did anybody ever bring up the subject of multiple personalities? She said, well, no. I said, you have a personality inside you that wants you dead. And because you were raped by your grandfather at eight years of age, you split off an aspect of identity that believed you were worthless. And suddenly she starts screaming. She's a piece of blank, blank, blank. She deserves to die. I've got to kill her. I've got to get rid of her. She's just a piece of trash. That was not her speaking. That was the child who had been raped, who developed this hate, mm -hmm. a hatred for the self, a self-hatred. And then, of course, the demon just jumps right in on that. So mm -hmm. if you don't understand simple things like dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. you, you can be talking to something that's not a demon and you think it's a demon and you're trying to cast it out. You're just wasting your time. It's not mm -hmm. going anywhere. In fact, you're making the matters worse. This is one of the problems I have with mass deliverance. I think there's a place for it. I've done it. As you well know, sometimes you're, you're in a crowd of people. You just do what you can to help as many people as you can. You pray for them, lay hands on them, and you, you just pray to God that, that some good is being done by it. It's not the process we're just talking about tonight. Mm -hmm, yes. but, but, but not everything's the screaming and yelling and mm -hmm. manifesting and thrashing about is mm -hmm. necessarily a demon. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that understanding and you're watching some of the characteristics, I've had situations where even in my own seminars and the prayer service that we have afterwards, mm -hmm. I'll see somebody thrashing around. I'm watching the behavior and I'm watching, you know, what they say and do. And I walk over and I say, just everybody get out of the way. This is not a demon. And they're like, what do you mean this isn't a demon? Well, this is not a demon. And then I look into the face and I say, who are you? Mm -hmm. Who's doing this? Oh, if it's a demon, it's going to snarl and mm -hmm. <laughs> reach out and mm -hmm. swing at me. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the body just relaxed. I said, I want you to tell me who you are and how you got there. And she said, well, I'm the one who, you know, I'm the one who was raped when she was 14. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a, that's a long answer to your question. Yeah. And do you, like, these and I'm gonna, nuances are crucial. And I'm going to interject. And so when it's a multiple personality, you open that uh, really uh, beautiful, like in this case that you minister today, do you minister to this personality uh, that split and then you ca cast out a demon if the demon is behind there instead of just going hard after a demon right away, correct? Exactly. I, I, I begin to reason with this bitter, hateful, angry part of the, uh, the old woman. I said, look, you're mad at the wrong person. Mm -hmm. you're mad at the body you're in. It's the devil who did this. Mm -hmm. And I, it, I just, I want you to go back and experience when you first came into being in this woman's mind. And then I brought Jesus into that. And I said, no, Jesus wants to heal you. Now, the minute we performed the healing process and she opened her eyes, I said, okay, Jezebel, and then I got that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I said, now, Jezebel, you have nothing to hold on to anymore. Mm -hmm. You're leaving. Mm -hmm. That's good. So bringing healing to the person, a split part of their personality and, and also confronting the evil spirits. I know that we've kind of mentioned a little bit, but in a lot of deliverances that you conduct and a lot of deliverances that also we do, we find out that the demon didn't necessarily enter through this person's sin, but it's been there yes. for generations. And could you speak a little bit more into the importance of knowing someone's ancestry, family history when doing deliverance on them? Well, one of the questions on our intake is, what's your ancestry? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certain ones just jump out. They say Ukrainian, they got demons. <laughs> And you have in your, in your school, really got demons. and you in your school, you actually have 
you go through the main demons that you have encountered in different territories and and very yes. actually thorough, very thorough um, training that you have on that, which I would really encourage. We're going to drop the link for that school, but continue. I apologize for interrupting. Well, that's OK. We actually identify mm -hmm. in our advanced Academy of Deliverance 18 ethnocentric geographical regions of the world and the demons that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me you're from Ireland or you tell me you're from Italy, your ancestors, or you tell me you're from Sweden or wherever it may be, one of the Slavic countries, it doesn't mean it's a positive confirmation. It just means I've narrowed the range of what I'm looking for. Certain types of demons follow certain kinds of bloodlines. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a kind of a joke, but I'm very serious about it. It's always the Italians. <laughs> so when somebody tells me they're Italian, an Italian is a Roman. Hmm. Well, what were the Romans? Brutal, barbaric, idolatrous, perverted. So, and, and if they say Sicily, <laughs> I know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with the mafia. I'm dealing with crime. Mm -hmm. People may say, well, those are stereotypes. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. If we go back and look at Greco-Roman culture, we know what it was mm -hmm. like. And if somebody's ancestors go back there, mm -hmm. there's going to be an element of that in their identity. And they've got to renounce it. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe they just renounce it and that's it. There's nothing else. But if when they renounce that, okay, I'm half German. What do Germans do? They start wars, okay? So let's renounce the bloodshed of the Germans and all that they've done in the brutality over the last century. What's the harm in that? You may antagonize a demon when you do it mm -hmm. and you know you're on to something. So good. So good. Come on. Yeah. And you guys, you need to take the school, <laughs> take the classes. We're dropping the link because I believe that it will help you really just expose your mind. The world is way more spiritual than most of us realize and and this whole thing by people who don't do deliverance or don't embrace the warfare worldview you know that oh you guys are just seeing a demon behind every bush everything is a demon everything is a demon and stuff so things are just things are just way more spiritual than we realize um when what are some of the biggest mistakes that people make and especially i know that you have a lot of people who actually come to you who've been through a deliverance before somewhere else and I'm pretty sure one day you're gonna write a book of like 101 things not to do during deliverance for young people like us but what are some of the biggest mistakes you see people make when conducting personal deliverance well we've already pointed some of them out mm -hmm. lack of due diligence to gain fundamental information about the person what they've been through uh, you can do great harm to somebody who's very fragile if they've been through a lot of abuse in their life. So it's very helpful to know how aggressive approach you take or you don't want to take. And sometimes people are not aggressive enough or they are too aggressive without being considerate of what that person has been through. And they damage them further. That's one thing. Another thing is, as you discussed earlier, telling the demons not to speak losing the opportunity of interrogation to get primary information from the primary source and testing it to see if it's accurate. The other thing is um, just rushing in to pray for somebody without even in, even in a mass deliverance. Sometimes it's possible if you're working with somebody at the altar, as many churches do, just ask them a couple of basic questions. Don't just jump in and just start rebuking the devil. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. What is the problem in your life? Well, how can I best meet your need? You know, connect with that person as a human being, not just an object to pray for and conquer the devil. That's that's crucially important. And 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 not having the broader vision of wholeness in the person's life. You know, some deliverance ministers just want to get the demon out. Get, no, who's next? Who's next? Who's next? It's it's. Jesus never did that. Think of the hours he spent talking to the woman of the well. We don't even know. He might have cast demons out of her, but he took some time to get to know her, let her talk about her life and draw her out where he could really speak living water to her. And, and 
And in other cases, he let demons speak. He asked the father, well, how long has it been like this? Tell me about his life. What's going on? Those are the biggest mistakes people make. And I think I, I would call it the, the arrogancy of the unenlightened in deliverance. They're just unenlightened as to how important this process is to reflect the spirit of Christ, how he would work with somebody in that circumstance. You know, would he just grab them and start shaking them and speaking in tongues and yelling and screaming and hollering at them? It's like, whoa, wait a minute. If this, this person's been through trauma. If they've got PTSD, guess what? You just pushed them over the edge. They don't have a clue what you're doing. And maybe they, they, they don't have a history in church. They haven't been around anything like this. So just, I think the biggest mistake is not being sensitive to the person and honoring them and respecting them and an understanding that, that they're broken. That's why they come to you. And, and you can't break them anymore. You've got to be very careful of that. That's so good. That is so well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that everybody needs to rewatch this, just this segment as well. It's so powerful. Um, there were a few videos where you've posted one video recently where you posted where you got punched by a person uh, during a deliverance. <laughs> and uh, I know that you actually go through even in your school of deliverance, uh, talking about how to situate a room, prepare a room. But what safety measures should a person take when doing a personal deliverance and can a demon punch you or is that more of a person with a mental illness who has a demon that punches you well uh, I, i've had my ribs broken uh this last occasion that you're mentioning i was knocked unconscious my wife had to step in and take over and rebuke this demon <laughs> until until the demon collapsed uh, here is the mistake I made in that case. Uh, some people came to see me to get help. They'd filled out the paperwork. We knew what the problems were. And in advance, if, if we see it's a man, prison record, currently using meth, I'm going to get people capable of restraining them. In this particular case, they brought this young man I won't go into the whole story. They were very sincere in bringing him. And, and so they brought other people. I mean, their whole family. Then we had processed them and did the intake on them. But we had nothing on this guy. Hmm. Well, would you pray for him? I tried to be a nice guy. All right, I'll, I'll pray for him. This is a 16-year-old kid just sitting in a chair right next to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have the information to know the background. His father was a murderer. His father had recently killed himself. This kid had been in and out of detention centers using drugs, a history of violence. So I'm just sitting talking to him. I'm not even rebuking the demon. And boom, like that. Next thing I know, I'm out cold. He hit me so fast. If I had known these things, I wouldn't have gotten as close to him. Mm -hmm. I would have kept some distance and I would have had some strong men there mm -hmm. to grab him if he started to get out of hand. So this is why it's so important. Know something about the history of the person before you get too up close and personal. <laughs> wow, wow. So is it possible? Because I and I'm just going to admit in here that, well, I, I don't know everything, but I thought the Bible says that, you know, Jesus says nothing by name, no means will hurt you. But you're, you're saying something else. You're saying that it's it's possible. I remember we had a deliverance conference here in Seattle and and this guy this close. I, I was if I wouldn't move my hand fast enough, my head fast enough because our just couldn't catch him. I would have been knocked out cold right in front of everybody. And then so thankfully I moved my head fast enough. And then during the night, uh, this guy that we were doing deliverance uh, on, the deliverance wasn't completed and he, we had all of our deliverance ministers stay in one hotel, but one, one of our guys got a room in another hotel before us. So he stayed there by himself, but nobody knew on which floor he stayed in, which room he stayed in. And so it turns out that this guy that we were doing deliverance the night before breaks into his room, 
takes him with one hand, picks him up and starts to choke the living life out of him. I mean, blood afterwards. I mean, thankfully he, you know, uh, rebuked uh, and everything, but still the guy had his, his hands in his, in his uh, throat and then the mom came and, you know, pulled him down and police came and etc. and stuff. So, and of course we, <laughs> we jokingly said to our, our deliverance minister said, now you're ready for, for deliverance because you got battle scars. <laughs> and so, but, um, but on the spiritual or well, legal me, components, demons have the pretty much, they can do that. Well, let, let me, let me draw a distinction. Here, okay. Okay. It's real simple. You can tell a demon what to do. Back off. He has, you have absolute authority. Yeah. But if, if, if it's the person in okay. their own violence, or if it's a multiple personality, that suddenly quickly, just like a split second, okay. a violent murderous personality inside of them suddenly comes up. And that's what happened with his kid. Okay. This was a personality that hit me, not him. Because when he came to, he was in tears. I'm on the floor, wow. unconscious. And, and he's, he's, what did I do? He had no idea what had happened. It was not him who hit me. But and it wasn't the demon. It was a violent part of his mind that took over for a split second. Okay. And that's what you got to watch out for. It isn't the demon. Mm -hmm. It's the person who's capable of terrible evil. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Not everything Jeffrey Dahmer did was a demon. Mm -hmm. Some of it, he took over and he mm -hmm. worked out his own fancies, mm -hmm. fantasies in a cannibalistic way. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, clarifying that. Have you had, um, I know that this comes from the movies, but, and I didn't experience this, but we've had few deliverances where demons, you know, make the person seem to be dead or deaf or blind or do all of these things. Have you had experiences where somebody died during deliverance? close that close i had a person one time that the demon said i'm going to kill him uh -huh. and you're going to jail wow. and then they just went comatose wow and we didn't have a way to test blood pressure but they started to turn blue their pulse rate went down 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 and and they they went into a coma and I thought, oh my goodness, what do I do? What do you do? You pray him back to life. I just kept calling this person back to life, Satan. You, I'm not going to jail for murder. No, I'm not. I'm not going to be scandalized by this. I will not stand for that. Back off. We speak life and breath into this person, and it it actually took a couple of hours for them to come back around. And we just had to wait and be patient. People standing around praying, constantly rebuking the devil, telling him to let this person go until finally they came back. That's the closest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And more on the, the legal component, uh, Dr. Bob, when during deliverance, we're doing a deliverance one-on-one -on -one and we find out that a person molested somebody, not been the victim molestation, but actually did the molestation or murdered somebody. As a deliverance minister, what is our legal ramifications to report things like that? Or do we just keep things confidential and we don't tell the police or the law enforcement? Well, um, I don't know if you follow the Southern Baptists at all, but they're going through a major upheaval. This is the largest Protestant denomination in America because many of our pastors did that. Catholic Church had the same issue. They didn't report things. It depends, first of all, from state to state. Mm -hmm. uh, every state law is different. You should need to know the laws in your state and reportability That's and That's clergy cool. confidentiality. And then the question is, well, who's doing this deliverance? Are you an ordained minister? Uh, are you entitled to clergy confidentiality? Or are you just a, a good mm -hmm. neighbor trying to help somebody? Uh, you need to be very cautious about those type of things. Now, we do have people, in addition to the intake, they sign a release mm -hmm. and the release clearly states that, you know, exorcism is something in which harm might come either to the exorcist or the person receiving the exorcism because it's a, a demonic supernatural event and we do not take responsibility for that. However, more pointedly to the issue of abuse, um, there are some things that have to be evaluated uh, in, in terms of reportability. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
is the person name? Is it a random person? Well, if it's a random person, there's really nothing to report if it's a rape or if it's a molestation. So you always want to know, was it a stranger that you can't identify or was it a family member? Or was it an extended member of like the church community or something who did something like this? And, and then if you feel there is an obligation to report it, because here's the key, is someone else at danger? In other words, most pedophiles, for example, have sometimes three to 400 victims they've mm -hmm. discovered. Mm -hmm. So is there an obligation to stop this from going any further? And you don't depend upon the person because they might be a psychopath. Mm -hmm. and capable of lying to your face. Mm -hmm. All you know is if an individual is violated and you can prove it, that's the provability. Because when you go to the police, the first thing they want to know is, can you prove that this happened? Mm -hmm. and, and we have a civic responsibility as well as a moral responsibility to deal with some of these issues. And they're very hard. But, but again, it's a matter of how factually will the authorities treat it and is there sufficient information that you can go to them in which case you need to go mm -hmm. now let's get to the the fun part um who um what do you say <laughs> this to is all fun <laughs> I know. what do you say to people who say that charging for deliverance is non-biblical um i say several things is the labor worthy of his hire mm -hmm. okay and then i say to them when you go to church on sunday does the pastor never take an offering really well of course he does it's how he funds the church so you're paying to go to church mm -hmm. now it's true you may not pay but you're not going to get much <laughs> because you're not giving and not receiving sure. but there's there's you're there it's intimidating when that offering plate goes by mm -hmm. and somebody else puts something in and you don't let's just face it there's an intimidation process there mm -hmm. <laughs> well no it's all right to intimidate people by putting them on public display of a plate passing in front of them so it's not okay to provide for the needs of a ministry in all the years I've been in ministry, I've only had one church ever put our ministry on their permanent budget for a very small amount, but they did it. Wow. I've never had a church say, you know what? We're going to help to support you on a regular basis to lessen the load of what you need to do. So to do what I do, you know, I'm on YouTube too. You know what equipment costs. You know what studios cost, facilities to carry on this ministry. I have a staff. I have overhead. I have capital investments I have to make. Well, how do I pay for that? If I depend on the goodwill of the evangelical, charismatic, and past Pentecostal pastors of America, I'm not even talking to you right now. Okay, this, this conversation is not taking place. And all these stories I'm telling you about thousands and thousands of people who have been saved, healed, and delivered doesn't happen. So I had to figure out a model, mm -hmm. something. And so the therapeutic model, because much of what we do, I've had, I've had clinicians, psychiatrists, and medical doctors sit down with me and they say, you know, 90% of what you do is what we do. Well, you just take it that extra 10%, mm -hmm. but you're basically doing therapy with these people, but it's in a spiritual context. Mm -hmm. You don't go to the doctor and complain when he says you have to have surgery because you're going to die. How much does that cost? Save my life, doctor. Okay. So the infrastructure, the capital investments that we have to make the facilities that we have to have that has to come from somewhere or my voice is silenced mm -hmm. so we ask people the sheriff suggested donation we put a number on that now i will tell you and i don't like to say this because i don't want everybody knocking my front door down but if somebody can't 
we take that in consideration. Mm -hmm. And many times we do offer services for free for people who we know are desperate and can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a certain amount of time that's allocated to help people. I cannot tell you the many times that somebody scheduled an hour with me and it's nine o'clock at night and I've been here for five hours and I'm still praying for them and nobody's given them a bill. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, yeah. we have minimums by which we know our budget has to be met. Mm -hmm. We give discounts to veterans. We give discounts to those in ministry. Many times a pastor needs help and comes to see me. I just say, look, you know, if you want to give an offering to the ministry, that's fine. But just mm -hmm. let me sow into your life. So we sow to some people, other people sow into us. Mm -hmm. wow. And it has to work in terms of capitalization and funding. Otherwise, there is no ministry. Mm -hmm. And I'm a practical man. Mm -hmm. And I've asked exactly. the Lord to show me the various models that we have, mm -hmm. like our school of exorcism. And we're about to release some more video training. Well, what does it cost for me to film it, to have video editing, to have production value and all the things that have to go into it. So it makes it into something people want to watch and will be better skilled to go out and help other people. Thousands, thousands. We spent about a hundred thousand dollars over the last six months in capitalization of some new ventures we're doing in the video area. Where mm -hmm. do I get that money? Mm -hmm. From the people who have helped. Mm -hmm. And anything else I've discovered. There are some people that God calls you to sow your life into and never receive anything back mm -hmm. because it's the mercy of Christ that you're extending. Yeah. But the majority of people if you do that, they don't appreciate it. Hmm. They really don't. They don't appreciate it. That's good. And it deprives them of an opportunity to do something. I've found this. The people who give the most, who sacrifice the most, who fast the most, and who give up the most to come and see us, get the most. That's what Jesus was saying to the Syrophoenician woman. How serious are you about this? And Jesus had her on her knees begging for crumbs fed to dogs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go criticize Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> it's, a, That's good. it's a touchy area. It's too easy to take cheap shots uh -huh. without understanding. Yeah. What it takes to run a ministry. It's mm -hmm. like you. You don't pass the offering plate. What are you going to do? You're not going to be sitting in front of that microphone. Mm -hmm. If you don't encourage people to give their tithes and offerings, you disappear. And all the yeah. great and incredible work that you and mm -hmm. your people are doing for the kingdom of God, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a lot of people, people. Yeah, a lot you're of people. You're charging them every Sunday. Yeah, I wonder if, like, <laughs> and, and we have some people in the chat right now who would, like, yeah, this is wrong. And I would just ask them just to do one thing. I would want them to go to work for next seven days and not ask their boss to pay them. That's all. And I want you to do exactly for another seven days and then to do it for the rest of their life. And then the very thing that you are saying for uh, Dr. Bob to do, you do. Meaning trust God and let God provide. See, yet all of us, we work and we, uh, we expect our employer uh, to pay us. And the Bible clearly states the worker is worthy of his wages. And so, and Jesus expected that he taught his disciples to do that. He says, when you go to different places, he says, don't take extra clothes because people will provide for you. And so, um, and so there's nothing wrong with, uh, with that when we encourage people. Plus, you know, when people, uh, uh, Dr. Bob, when they go into your, you know, deliverance session, you're, you know, you, you have a doctoral degree, your, your experience, your time is extremely valuable. And, and they keep saying a lot of times, people say, well, but look, this minister does it for free. Yeah, he, he, but you can't get in line with him because he doesn't have time available for you. 
and stuff. So like, for example, people say, well, look, Vlad doesn't charge. Yeah, but also Vlad doesn't offer deliverance on Zoom because I just can't do that because my, my commitment is, is to this ministry. And so, and for those of you who are maybe here and thinking that, you know, deliverance ministers do it for money or this is a money making machine. You have no idea. You probably have never done a deliverance. Um, people who do deliverance, people like Dr. Bob, who have ribs that are broken, got knocked out and, and so much stuff that he goes through. I'm pretty sure there's so many other ways to make money and to make a living. It's a calling, it's a passion, but it's also something that the Lord gives us specific instruction in His Word as in the Old Testament, so in the New Testament and Apostle Paul exemplified that, that people who um, work, they need to get paid. And if you don't want to, you can always well, go get know, deliverance got, for free I've got somewhere staff else. Of people in this building too, you know. Yeah. Qualified people who help me to help people who minister them. We have associate ministers as well. Mm -hmm. Does them all over the country, and 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 their livelihood yeah. has to be looked after as well. So we sow into them as well. So yeah. there's a bigger picture here rather than just pointing a finger and not asking honest questions. And I appreciate the question. I appreciate that. Well, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, answering them and clarifying that as well. Um, now, for people who want to learn, I know we made a lot of references today to different materials that you have. Um, I personally subscribe, am subscribed to your emails and to your yeah. YouTube channel. Could you tell us a little bit more, if people want to learn more about Deliverance, some of the resources or some of the courses that you have uh, in your ministry that people can take advantage of today? Well, they can go to boblarson.org or to schoolofexorcism.org and get the details. But basically, uh, I've written 40 plus books, uh, about 20, 25 of those, and certainly a hardcore of about 10 of them would be great for them to get. It, it says it all. They can sit down and they can digest it. They should get our books. We have a members only channel on YouTube. Uh, we're at for just $19.99 a month, you get 150 videos you have access to, and, and it grows exponentially every month. In addition to that, the School of Exorcism and the Advanced Academy, and we have coming additional uh, educational institutions that we're developing. But right now, we have 30 videos training. You've been through that. Mm -hmm. The School of Exorcism, the Advanced Academy has another 10 hours worth of training, uh, testing, and certification to get really serious mm -hmm. about this matter of deliverance. So the books, our YouTube channel, we do a blog every week. We mm -hmm. teach on crucial issues like you do. You have great teachings out there. I, I love watching your stuff all the time. I, I do it when I'm working out in the morning. So I'm, I'm listening to Pastor Vlad <laughs> talking on the latest topic. And I love some of the stuff you've been doing in sex and marriage and families and all that sort of thing. That's great coming from a young pastor's heart. That is really great to speak that into uh -huh. the lives of young people. It's wonderful. I encourage people to watch that. Uh, Thank you. If you just go to BobLarson.org, mm -hmm. it's all there. But I want to encourage you people to make the investment to uh, to sow into our ministry and sow into your life by getting these videos, these training videos. When you sit down and watch them, we have a study guide. Mm -hmm. You can study along with it and then be tested for your proficiency and mm -hmm. gain knowledge. Just, just don't go off like a Wild West gunslinger shooting at the first thing that moves. Mm -hmm. Be a sniper, a mm -hmm. spiritual sniper where you're looking through that lens and you're getting the devil between the eyes. That's the difference. That's what we need to raise and train people up to do. And that's the burden of my heart. My, my gift is teaching. Mm -hmm. I've evangelized, but my real mm -hmm. gift is teaching mm -hmm. and taking this information and experience and distilling it into something that you can look at, learn, mm -hmm. and you too Jesus has called all of us, Amen. maybe not to the level you are or the level I am, some gr greater than things. I mean, I, I, I pray that uh, this new generation, you and others be ra raised up 
you know, it's going to be greater than anything I ever tried to achieve, you know, mm -hmm. because the need is greater. Mm -hmm. The power of Christ, I believe, is greater to do these things. Let's mm -hmm. learn. Let's study. Let's grow. Mm -hmm. Let's dig in deep because the enemy is powerful. The forces of evil are exponentially growing all mm -hmm. around us. I minister to a young woman today virtually. And uh, she was telling me about all these spells she's putting on her friends. She's a Christian. Wow. I said, where'd you learn to do that? TikTok. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, we did, you, know, you and I didn't have to grow up with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know I'm Neanderthal, but you didn't even have to grow up with that. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. yeah. And, and people sometimes people sometimes argue. They're like, why do you guys have to talk about this and talk about that? Jesus didn't. But you have to understand that that generation did not have a TikTok. We we have a crazy, crazy generation. Uh, Bob, bef before I let you go, just just a fun question. Did you ever have people when you walk in the airport manifest? or like restaurants i know sometimes people think of an exorcist yes. they think of like if they walk demons just might do you have people do that yeah but but you can't do anything about it i mean you really can't in a practical sense you can't do anything uh -huh. I've, I've i've checked into a hotel and i swear if lucifer was checking me in you know oh my goodness <laughs> everything that could go wrong went wrong and it's really hard to keep my cool Wow. Uh, wow. But, you know, I've, I've seen that happen mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing you can really do about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, once in a while, I've said something to somebody. I've just, you know, gently said, by the way, I'm an exorcist. You need some help. <laughs> Let me know. But it's the world we live in. The, not just the people who are coming to your church and your conferences, the people who are coming to me virtually and in person. Uh-huh. The world is demonized people all around us. Yeah. Okay. It's like, who doesn't have demons? Vlad and I? That's about it. Well, maybe Isaiah and a few others and Pagani <laughs> and so on, but there, there's not, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I'm not so sure about you. <laughs> Come on, especially some of the people in the chat. I'm reading the chat. I'm I, not sure about myself sometimes. <laughs> Do you think just, just uh, you have like just a few more minutes? I just have a few. Uh, when I, when I have you, you're like an encyclopedia of information. I feel like if I could have like 10 hours of just like so many most asked questions. I get these questions asked a lot and there's so many opinions on that. And I feel like we're going back to the to the to the deliverance. So I'm just going to ask maybe like two more questions. One of them is if somebody is married to a demonized or demon possessed person, should they stop having a physical relationship with them since we know the demons get transferred through uh, physical, you know, sexual contact? Well, the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Okay. And so let's say it's the wife. The husband's got demons. She mm -hmm. can sanctify the marriage bed through her prayers, through her godly living, mm -hmm. because she still is in a responsibility not to re defraud the person with whom she is in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is very clear about that. If he's a good man, but he's got some issues, you know what? He wants to stay in that marriage and he loves you and he lets you practice your faith and he's not beating you or whatever. Sanctify the bed, pray over it. When he's not around, put some anointing oil on it and then enjoy yourself. Come on, that's good. That's good. And I know this answer, but for some people, they still, especially traditional people, they believe that demons can jump on you from watching demons being cast out. <laughs> demons are not that desperate, really. <laughs> There's too many people they can get far more easy than that. So, you know, in some ways, it's hard to get a demon. Mm -hmm. You got to really work at it. You got to smoke a lot of weed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't, they just don't can't willy nilly. Now they can follow through the bloodline, mm -hmm. but uh, you can't get a demon. It's not a contagion. Mm -hmm. You know what? Oh, don't go to a Bob Larson meeting, or don't 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 watch his videos because they'll jump on you. Demons are only going to go where they are welcome. That's good. And if they're welcome, that's your problem, not mine. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, last question, Bob. 
Do you think that demons, I know it's pretty popular now with uh, Michael Heiser's book on disembodied spirits of Nephilims and and I read a lot of your books and I don't see a lot of emphasis on where demons came from because I feel like you're more focused on where they're all going and trying to send them there as soon as possible. But just the personal opinion of Dr. Bob Larson, who do you think those demons are? Are they fallen angels? Are they disembodied spirits of the Nephilims or... Well, first of all, and I'm not saying this anything against Dr. Heiser. He's a well-educated man. He's a theologian. He's got some interesting things to say. I've read his books. But if somebody wants to speak in that realm, I don't care who they are. If they don't cast out demons, their credibility is lost in my eyes. You can't theorize about these things you got to bring the empirical and the experiential with the theological. And when you don't, you got a link missing. You're not going to see it the way it needs to be seen. Now, I've had all types of people come to me and say, well, what about this, this thing, this disembodied thing here, and this thing over here, and this is claiming this, and this is claiming that. Demons are fallen angels. Classic 2,000-year-old Orthodox theology, go back and read Augustine, go back and read Aquinas. I've read all these people and, mm -hmm. you know, read what they were observing in the early church and what they were doing. Now, do, do I believe that the Nephilim existed? Yes. I have a chapter in my Jezebel book about the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. Do I believe that it's possible at the end of the age when it finally is ready to collapse? Mm -hmm that that uh, artificial intelligence line or something gets muddied and we get hybrids again partial human i've had i've had these spirits say to me we are impregnating women now just watch what's coming will the antichrist be born from such a union hmm. i think it's entirely possible but that doesn't get anybody free Mm -hmm. theorizing so true. theologizing doesn't deliver a person from mental physical and emotional mm -hmm. torment so it's okay to speculate but pick up your cross pick up your bible and go out and do something about it mm -hmm. come, on. come on that's come the on. problem pastor vlad we're not doing anything on a practical basis jesus taught he taught deep things he taught in parables he did all of this and then what did he do he went and cast out more demons Come and he on. healed more people and he demonstrated the theology and the theory by putting it into practice if you don't put it into practice don't speak to my life i'm sorry come on and that's a that's a perfect ending right there i always tell people jesus did not speci specifically said where they came from that means it's not important but he did tell us what to do with them and that is to drive them out and if we don't do that part but we, we spend our whole life trying to speculate where they came from and all of this stuff and so and i like how you said it it's just it's better to stick with the classic doctrinal approach to something that's been believed by christians for the last two thousand years instead of trying to speculate into something that we, we, we have no business doing it and not casting out demons. Well, Dr. Bob, oh, I have, thank you. I have 30 seconds before you hang up on me. Yeah, 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 yeah. go ahead. I, I just want to say how thrilled I am and excited I am. My wife, Laura, and I talk about this all the time. What's happening with you and the other young men and women out there that are rising up, whether or not I agree with everything, whether or not they all agree with me, whether or not we're all together in a room and saying we're in perfect harmony, all singing the same song. You guys are out there doing something. You're doing something that hasn't been done before. I've never seen a generation like this. I, 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 I thought I would be with the Lord before anything like this happened and rose up. And I'm, I'm excited. I, 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 for years, my, my wife kept saying to me, it's going to happen. God's going to break this deliverance thing loose and, and people are going to start paying it. I said, I don't think so. The church is never going to allow it in America. He squished it. And you guys come along through COVID and YouTube and, and, and all the rest of it. And I'm so proud of you, Pastor Vlad. And I could name all the other guys, you know, you know who you Thank are. You. And maybe some unknowns that are about ready to rise up out of the rumble and start chasing demons. Go for it. 
Thank go you. for it. Let's do it. It's the greatest day of opportunity for this ministry in the history of the church since the first three centuries. And I'm, I'm just so thrilled. I can't say enough about it. Every day, Laura and I talk about how excited we are that you guys are out there taking up the sword and you're out there chasing thousands away. God bless you for it and your families and, and all who are part of you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your kind words. I, I believe and I sense that the Lord is doing something amazing. It's almost like this, this revival is taking place. I was just uh, a month ago at Greg Locke's church and you know, who uh, grew up in a, as a Baptist pastor and started to see the moving of the Holy Spirit. And six months ago, deliverances broke out. He's like, I don't believe in this stuff. And he's baptizing a person, the demons manifesting. And he's like, what do I do? And so he started to search deliverance, start reading books on deliverance. And now it's been the last six months and deliverance is happening every Sunday night. Um, and they're teaching their teams and I'm sitting there. It's like almost 3000 people. And he flew pastors from all around the United States he paid for their tickets, paid for their hotel so that they could hear about deliverance. And I'm sitting there, I was like, you got to be kidding. This is incredible. I mean, 10 years ago, the idea that somebody will host a conference on this level and talk about this topic was, 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 was weird. I mean, we were weird. And now it's, I'm realizing it's not weird. It's wild though. It's exciting, but, but it's not weird. It's the ministry that Jesus did. And uh, thank you, uh, sir, for pioneering that, speaking into that, never giving up and running through it without compromise, without drama, without uh, all kinds of um, scandals, you know, and walking in that integrity. Because I think that's also a huge sign because a lot of these guys, a lot of us, myself included, we're just running right now. And so we're just starting. And so to us, it's a it's a beautiful example that to, to run, not to exchange this for some other ministry and start focusing on other stuff, but to not give up on deliverance, whether it's popular or not popular, and also not give up on integrity and walk in purity and righteousness, because ultimately, you know, that's really, that will speak to the uh, validity to the, a genuineness of what is doing if we not just start right but when we finish right amen Great. thank you sir ah, thank you powerful appreciate you okay thank you so much pastor